Will you join me in prayer? Holy Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Forty years before the events depicted in today's lesson from the book of Joshua, the children of Israel had suffered a horrendous failure of courage. Moses had sent twelve spies to spy out the land, the land that had been promised to the children of Israel as their homeland, a land flowing with milk and honey. The, the spies found the land to be precisely what they had wanted, beautiful, productive, greatly to be desired. However, they also found that the land was inhabited by the sons of Anak, giants in whose sight the Israelites seemed to themselves as grasshoppers. God had promised to fight their battles for them, but they did not believe him. To say that God was displeased is an understatement because, because of their lack of faith, the Lord swore that none of the children of Israel of that generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, would enter the promised land. There follows 40 years of wandering in the wilderness while a new generation is trained in faith and learns to live as free men rather than slaves. Finally, the time has come for this new generation to go forward in faith, to conquer the land that their fathers had been afraid to enter. We're not sure why during the wilderness years the practice of circumcision was not practiced. However, whatever the reason, and even though this young generation was much more courageous than their fathers, it was absolutely essential that they clearly understand that only with God's help would they be able to possess the land. The battles they would fight, if they fought in their own strength, they would lose. They were the Lord's army, but it was the power of God that would win the battles. Therefore, the commitment to their strength, to their God, must be complete and it must be explicit. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> to accomplish this purpose and to prepare them for the battles ahead, Joshua, against all military logic, as soon as they have crossed the Jordan, commands that all the men must be circumcised. They are without defensive positions and the circumcisions will render the men unable to fight for weeks until healing has occurred. This critical commitment accomplished, the children of Israel will be able to confront and conquer the sons of Anak, the giants in the land, for the Lord will fight their battles. This new beginning is accomplished as the reproach of Egypt is rolled away. In other words, the history of slavery and subjugation must be forgotten, buried in the deep waters of God's grace and mercy. They are called to be free from their slavery in thought and in deed. For the children of Israel, circumcision was a sacrament, a sacred oath that marked them indelibly as belonging to God. The word sacrament is derived from the oath a Roman soldier gave to his legion. It was the most binding and irrevocable commitment known to the ancient world. And circumcision is parallel for Christians to baptism. Baptism is an open and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It is a public declaration that we have committed ourselves, body and soul, to the Lord Jesus Christ. All that we do in his name is not done in our strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, which Christ imparts to those who believe in, adhere to, and trust in his saving power. You will note that the gospel lesson for today is John the Baptist's stirring call to baptism for the remission of sins. Although the Judean people could claim to be descended from Abraham, that claim was insufficient to meet their needs. It was really far removed from their personal lives, and there was great, great distress in the population. Judea was occupied and oppressed by Rome. Any Jew could be required to carry a Roman pack for a mile, and resistance of any kind met with harsh and immediate reprisal. And even worse, the family itself was under great assault. The liberal rabbis taught such easy divorce that marriage was becoming a farce, and many women were deciding to remain unmarried rather than face the uncertainty and unfairness of a distorted doctrine which allowed the husband to discard at a whim the wife he had sworn to love, cherish, and protect. Sacrifice in the temple was a big business, 
But the corruption and greed and the arrogance and hypocrisy of the religious leaders was an open scandal. And confidence in the efficacy of ritual sacrifice to truly forgive sin was less and less adequate to comfort the souls of even the sons of Abraham. Accordingly, the call of John the Baptist swept the nation. Multitudes of the people came to the Jordan River there to confess their sins and to commit themselves in faith to a revival of trust in the goodness and mercy of God. They wanted to roll away the reproach of Egypt, to be freed from their sins. They wanted a new beginning. In both of these rituals, it was not the ritual itself which was effective. Rather, it was what lay behind the public consecration. The sacrament of circumcision and the sacrament of baptism both spoke to a commitment to trust the Lord God for his intervention in the lives of his faithful people. They were an act of faith and trust in the promises of God. They were laying hold of the promise of God that if with all your hearts you seek me, you shall ever surely find me, saith the Lord. All this is much more than simply an interesting discussion of ancient spiritual struggles. Nothing is more contemporary than the need for new beginnings. Nothing is more contemporary than the need to seek God's aid in fighting our battles. Nothing more contemporary than rolling away the reproach of Egypt, escaping the slavery and oppression of sin, and claiming our right under God to live lives of freedom and righteousness. There is a famous song which all of us have sung, often with patriotic fervor. One of the lines is, I am proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. It saddens me to say it, but I fear that song is less and less true. Americans are daily losing more and more of their freedom. Every aspect of our lives, from traffic laws, building codes, government regulation of our environment, regulation of our banking system and our health care, the education of our children, our phones, our emails, and indeed every click of a key on our computers is recorded and monitored. And most in in recently, regulation to transform the internet into a public utility has, promulgate is has been promulgated. All of these are eroding the sphere of personal freedom. Privacy is no more. Now I'm not opposed to regulation for the public good, but where does it stop? Some years ago in Blyville, Arkansas, where I was pastor of the First Presbyterian Church, a black grandmother was arrested in Walmart for slapping her grandson. The boy was attempting to shoplift to steal some small item, and the grandmother was addressing the issue in the moment. I remember her statement to the police. If you don't let me teach my grandson the difference between right and wrong, one day you will kill him. No doubt political correctness, the stifling of open comment, the strangling of public debate is one of the giants in the land that must be confronted. But the battle will be costly, and the willingness to engage will depend upon the courage that comes from our commitment to the Lord God. On a more personal and individual level, the decadence of our culture, the assault on morality, the effort to redefine marriage, the erosion of the family, are leading many in our younger generations to make, to engage in actions that truly enslave. I weep for the young women who trade virtue for acceptance and the young men who do not understand the necessity for self-discipline and their responsibility to protect and defend their families. You see, swimming as we have for most of our lives in a world hostile to God, a world under the dominion of Satan and filled with the unholy, the unworthy, and the dirty, we, despite our best efforts, have picked up, that is, we have become encumbered become soiled, as it were, with attitudes, habits, actions, guilt, and proclivities that we cannot continue to carry if we would receive the freedom and courage that is God's full blessing. The writer of Hebrews is speaking to this issue when he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. All of us, young and old, mature Christians, and those who may never have given themselves to the Lord of life, we all desperately need the full blessing of God. 
We need new beginnings. We need to roll away the reproach of Egypt. We need a fresh grasp of the truth that in Christ we are strong and secure and in our own strength carrying the enslaving baggage we so easily collect we are prey to the enemies of righteousness. When Gertrude Stein, a famous author, lay dying in Paris she was surrounded by her worldly wise friends. The room was quiet and no one seemed to know what to say. Gertrude rallied a bit and asked what is the answer? No one present knew the answer any more than she did, and the room remained silent. Gertrude's last words were, well then, what is the question? Well, there are many ways to frame the question. One is, how can we enter and possess the promised land of God, defeating the giants in the land? Another is, how can a person be born again or from above? Yet another is, how can we become new creatures, or how can we become new wineskins able to hold new wine? And it is Jesus who gives us the answer. Truly, truly, I say to you, said Jesus, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, my Father will honor him. Jesus also tells us, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We are encumbered with the reproach of Egypt. The world, as Wordsworth said, is too much with us. We carry the baggage of our sojourn in Egypt and we are reluctant to finally sever ourselves from the flesh pots and all that they offer. But when we come to the banks of the Jordan, and when we would enter the promised land, we must entreat the Lord to take away the reproach as we rid ourselves of our worldly baggage. We do that by sacredly committing our lives to God, instead of keeping our faith in a compartment. We consciously give ourselves away. We have done with our doubts. We cast ourselves completely upon the mercy of God. We claim unreservedly the promises of Jesus. We, as it were, sacramentally circumcise our hearts, committing ourselves to live in the light of the gospel of Jesus. The word of God becomes the fountain of our truth. We want to feed on the word of God. We want to taste the living water of the Holy Spirit. And we live in the world as pilgrims whose citizenship is in heaven. When we endure suffering, we count it all joy. And when we face death for ourselves or for those we love, we lift up our eyes to heaven, for our redemption draweth nigh. God is offering all of us new beginnings in a promised land of grace and glory. And my invitation to us all is that in this moment, right now, we cast ourselves upon the mercy of God. We commit ourselves with a sacred oath that we will serve the Lord and him only will we serve. Let us entreat the Lord to live in us, to fill our lives to the brim with his Holy Spirit so that he may fight our battles, so that the reproach of Egypt may be rolled away. They that have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen.